Hi, this is Melissa Nash with Checkmark Collections. Have you heard about Reg F yet? Well, you're about to. We've put together a series featuring seven short videos aimed at topics that are most relevant to the creditor, you. We're going to cover items such as call frequency and communication caps, itemization dates, information needed in the validation notice, and so forth. These issues are important to you as the creditor, and they're definitely important to us as the collection agency. If you have any questions after these videos, please feel free to reach out to me or one of your account executives in the office, and we'll be glad to answer any of your questions. At Checkmark Collections, we always put the check back into your business. This session deals with the validation notice, the initial communication to the consumer, and what information needs to be in the validation notice. This isn't new. This has been a part of the FDCPA and a requirement that has uh, long preceded the Regulation F changes. What Regulation F has done is added some information that needs to be in the validation notice and created some more consistency of what should be in the validation notice. So, Speaking, just backing up a second, the validation notice is, is a requirement under the FDCPA that needs to be sent to the consumer within five days of the initial communication. Typically what happens, it is the initial communication. The, the way that the process works is that the debt gets transferred over to the debt collector. That first letter gets sent out to the consumer with all the information we're going to talk about, and then the, the, the collection process begins after that. It's not, not as typical for there to be a communication, and then the validation notice gets sent out. So this generally is the first communication with the consumer. And the Regulation F, one of the things it has done is there, there were a lot of claims around the validation notice, a lot of class action claims around the validation notice that plaintiff or consumer attorneys would pick up something from it and claim that you know, it was confusing or, or what have you, and then there would be, you know, a large class action claim around it. What the, what the CFPB has at least attempted to do was create some more consistency around what should be in the letter and create more of a safe harbor for the debt collector so that if they're following these requirements and these rules, they shouldn't be subject to a class action claim. Now, with everything, there's a lot of gray and there's probably some opportunities still there for consumer attorneys to find ways to, to bring claims, but we're going to talk about what the Regulation F, what the CFPB has provided as far as guidance of what should be in the validation letter and what can provide a safe harbor. So the big news from this is that the CFPB actually provided a model validation notice. And so that's something that the industry has been asking for for many years so that we can use something that, that will protect us in the event of a lawsuit. You know, it's not necessarily what I would have chosen. There's parts of it that I, you know, that I, if I were, you know, had my druthers would change. But, but we do have a model validation notice. And so why this is important too for you to understand is that there, because of the safe harbor that's attached to using the model validation notice, there isn't going to be a lot of room to do changes. And so to the extent that you as the creditor are communicating with your debt collector and want to add and change and adjust that letter, that initial validation notice letter really can't be adjusted or changed. It, it needs to yeah. stay the same. This is not the time to be creative. In the, there are other opportunities, I'm sure, in the collection process to use new and different strategies, but this isn't really one of them. And Because you want to take advantage of this, like Jessica says, and um, this is just a very critical uh, period of time in the life of a collection of an account, right? The whole idea... The whole idea behind the regulation as it was behind the, the FDCPA's requirement is that you have a new entity involved in this process, not the creditor that the consumer is used to dealing with, but, uh, you know, ABC collectors. Who are you? Um, so this is intended to say, hey, we're collecting this debt for roto Rooter or whoever the creditor is. Um, here's the amount and gives the, uh, I'll let Jessica get into the details, but gives the consumer an opportunity to dispute 
the debt um, and ask for more information during a 30-day period, and which can't be overshadowed. And that's always been the source of uh, many class action lawsuits is that if the collector does something to overshadow the right to have 30 days to review this notice and ask for information or dispute, the collector can assume that they don't dispute and kind of go full speed ahead. So during really that whole 30-day period after sending this validation notice, you have to proceed with care, with, with caution. That's exactly right. And actually, under the Regulation F, they've, they've more or less given us a 35-day period because they give an extra five days to make sure the consumer has gotten it and, and all the rest. But that's why often collectors will wait to do any collection, other collection activity, until after the validation period has ended because it, it takes a lot of risk out of the situation. So there may be a 35-day period where they're not doing any active collections, and that's to decrease the risk you know, pretty significantly after that validation period ends. And so we're going to get into what is in the validation letter. So I will say that while there is the model validation letter that can be used and you know, might maybe should be used, it's not required. There can be, uh, the agency can create their own validation letter as long as it contains the information that is basically in the model validation letter. So let's go through some of that. First, the most one of the most important aspects is you know, information regarding the debt. As Chris said, the whole purpose of this is to give information to the consumer so that they say, okay, no, I don't know this entity, but I understand the debt or I understand why this entity is communicating with me. That includes the name and contact information for the collector, the consumer's name and ma mailing address, and the name of the creditor to who the debt is owed, the itemization date, so the date that uh, ties, some sort of date that ties the debt to the creditor, whether it be the uh, last payment date, the transaction date, and, and other dates that may give the consumer an idea of what this debt is about. The account number at the time of the itemization date, so that's going to be the creditor's account number often, uh, and then the amount due on the, on the date of the itemization date. And then it's also going to include the current amount due. So there's a lot of information about this particular debt, but if to the extent that there's interest being added or there's been fees or something that has been added, you're going to have the date the, the amount of the debt on the date of the itemization, and then the amount that is due on the date the letter is sent. So that, as I said, that should include then an itemization of any additional amounts that have been added, uh, interest, fees, payments, credits, et cetera. So this should give them a really good snapshot of what this debt is about, uh, how much I owe, you know, what I might recognize from when I incurred the debt, all of that information should be included on the validation notice. And some of this uh, itemization information, that that's a new requirement. Mm -hmm. That much of this was required in the FDCP already, but but uh, a lot of times uh, a collector would just provide a lump sum of this is the amount due now due as of the date of the, the letter. Well, because that's all the FDCPA required there to be. Right. That's and, all it required. And frankly, there was sometimes, you know, you're not as being as clear as you could be to the consumer by not breaking it all out. But in some ways, you're probably reducing your risk because there's a lot of lawsuits that have happened over, well, you've got a category for interest fees, but you really weren't entitled to fees, or you've got a zero in that um, category, and that implies that you were going to collect it in the future. So at any rate, now we've kind of crossed and Across that um, line, and you're required to do some of that. But hopefully, the silver lining is um, the consumer understands it and maybe is more willing to engage with the collector. Um, but the other thing that's important is, of course, it requires the collector and the creditor to again exchange accurate and detailed information about exactly what is owed, and really should be an agreement on what the interest is whether there are fees being charged, whether there's an ability to charge extra fees, because if there's not, that's going to be a, a ripe item for litigation or regulatory enforcement action. Yeah, I would say that one of the you know, potential tripwires of these new, the new information that needs to be included is that there's a lot of different data points, which means a lot of different opportunity for mistake. 
And one of the, you know, it may require data software changes to make sure that this, this line transfers over to your collector uh, and that this information is, is set apart so that the collector knows it and can put it in the letter. Uh, but the most important aspect of this is to, you know, sit down, talk to the collection agency, and make sure that you understand what the creditor is doing, what the collection agency is doing, and that you have a process and protocol in place to, to get that information transferred over in the most accurate way that you can. And, the, you know, in, in it, to the extent you do have proto protocols and policies in place, that can be helpful even if there is a mistake down the road and you get and the collection ag agency gets sued or something like that, there's a, a bona fide error defense that we use, which is basically if there were procedures and policies in place meant to address this mistake, but there was a mistake sort of in good faith, that can be a defense to litigation. And so that's why it's important that we do our best to, to, to create those policies and procedures for accuracy. So the second kind of big part of this letter is the consumer disclosures, the disclosures that are required in the initial validation notice to the consumer so they know what their rights are. And this isn't new really at all either. This is required under the FDCPA, but it sets out specifically what it, what is required. And so it's the consumer protection disclosures that are in the FDCPA regarding how they can dispute the debt, how they can request the name and address of the original creditor, um, it also will provide how they dispute. So often there is going to be a, in, in the letter, there's sort of a tear-off. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later here, but there's a tear-off portion where they can send it in and check a box that I dispute or check a box that I want this information. But you may also provide an opportunity for them to do that electronically. That That is a, allowed. Sure. So if you have an elect, the, you being the collection agency, if the collection agency has an, a way for them to dispute electronically, that will be set out in the letter too. And this is also going to include the mini Miranda, which is the statement that's required about that they are a debt collector, the information will be used at, uh, in the collection process. So that's required in the letter, and that's always been required. And then to the extent there are state-specific disclosures that uh, are required for the state they're collecting in, those need to be on there. Um, placement of those can be, there's some wiggle room there, but that needs to be on there too. And then that additional information can be found on the CFPB's website. So this gives the opportunity for the consumer to the extent they still don't understand <laughs> what they're getting to get directed to the CFPB's website, which has more than enough information to understand the process. And the CFPB, of course, is happy to take consumer comments and complaints about collection process, creditors, and agencies alike, so I'm sure the CFPB had a little self-interest in sticking this into the yes. model notice. <laughs> It'll direct some traffic to their site. Um, so that's the disclosure portion. And none of that, that is, infor that is language that is literally lifted from statute to letter. There is not wiggle room in that language, nor should there be. The other part of this is the consumer tear-off form. Now, in the model validation notice, it's literally a perforated section that gets torn off that makes it easy for the consumer to dispute, makes it easy for the consumer to ask for additional information. And so all of that is included on this tear-off. Um, you know, I think the downside is what I just said. It makes it really easy to dispute. It makes it really easy to request additional information. But I think the silver lining of that is we've had a lot of claims over the years with, with, with consumers saying they didn't understand that they had this right to do it. Even though the language is in there, even though you know clearly they didn't read the letter, um, but that there was some confusion about what, you know, I didn't know I owed this debt. I didn't know who I owed it to. Well, now you have a tariff portion that you can send back in, and, and if you fail to do that, I think that weakens that kind of lawsuit pretty considerably. I agree. So there, there is also, in addition to all this, so that's all the required. That is stuff that cannot be changed, should not be changed, needs to be in there. And so then there are some aspects that there's some optional language that can be added but isn't required. So, you know, telephone contact information for the collection agency. Usually there anyway. Yeah, <laughs> you'd want that in there. Um, a reference code, meaning, you know, it, that may be related to the letter vendor, that may be related to the collection agency themselves, may have some sort of internal reference code. And the reason they put this in here is there were a ton of lawsuits I mean, a number of years ago, related to 
codes that were in there, and there was some creative consumer attorneys who did a lot of um, wreaked a little bit of havoc with those reference codes. So the the CFPB has said those are not litigation worthy. Those are safe. We can put those in if if they're needed. They they help the collection process. Um, there's also Payment disclosures, so that you know, to figure out if, how to make payment, you can. I mean, there's a. It's it's not a. You really shouldn't think of this as a collection letter, because it's really just to give information. So there's not heavy collection effort in this letter, but there is the opportunity to pay. So I mean, that's important, obviously, that the consumer be able to pay off this initial notice and know how to do that. Uh, and then also some some allowance for language translation, Spanish language translation, uh, merchant brand, affinity brand, things that are a little bit on left field, I think, for this for this purpose, but that are for the purposes of making the collection process easier for the collection agency and have been deemed sort of safe to include uh, in these letters if necessary. And, you know, I just want to mention on that, if you're dipping your toes into providing a, a portion of a letter being translated, Make sure that uh, you're translating all the FDCP required notices, not just the part about payment. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen that over the years in the past. So yeah, that's uh, a really good point. You have to you have to be complete if you're doing a translation. Well, and I think that leads to I mean the the general requirement for all of the required language is that it must be clear and conspicuous. And so that's going to apply to if you if you then decide to add something to the letter that is allowed, it must be also clear and conspicuous. I would argue probably in a situation where you're only translating the payment portion and not the rest of it, that's probably going to be ripe for a claim under the not clear and conspicuous to the consumer. So that's a overarching requirement of a model valid of not a model the any validation notice must be clear and conspicuous that sets out all the requirements, all the disclosures. And the information regarding the debt. And so I think the, the big takeaway here is the validation notice, there's just a lot that has to be in it, a lot that can't really be changed. And so that is not, as Chris said, the, the point in collections to be creative or to be, make adjustments to the letter, that it really needs to be as it's set out by the CFPB and Regulation F. And it may take some more work or communication between the creditor and the collector to make sure all this itemization information is accurate. Um, so creditors should expect and hope that their agency is asking them those questions. Because if they're not, um, you know, you worry about whether this is being done correctly. But hopefully, the silver lining and upside is that this will uh, make it easier for the consumer to understand what is being, what the bill is, what amount is owed, make it less likely they're going to dispute and make it more likely that they're just going to uh, voluntarily work out a resolution. 